Hi everyone. Welcome to today's lecture. Since we've learned about processes and, and starting them up programmatically and duplicating them in the previous lecture, let's talk about how we manage those from the bash side. How do we actually control all these things running on the system? So first of all, how can we actually tell which processes are running? Um, this classic standard way to do this is with the ps command, which is short for processes. Uh, and by itself, it just gives us some information about what's running. It's not particularly useful when run by itself. So if you take a look here at this example, if I run ps, it'll tell me there's the bash shell that I, that I happened to be running at the time, and here's the ps command that I ran. So n that is interesting, but there's a lot more that's happening in regards to the connection that we have. So let me show you a couple different ways that I like to run the ps command that are a lot more uh, informative. So first of all, if I just run the alias command, it will show me all the different aliases that I have set up. And I've picked out the one here I want to talk about right now, and it's called psme, which is going to be a process list for just myself. And I've given it a different name um, so that I can refer to it specifically as uh, my particular implementation of it. And essentially what it does is it's going to take uh, the first row, this is what the head minus one n does, the first row of this particular instance of ps. And what that does is it's going to give me all these great headers, as you can see here. Then it's going to take this and it's going to run the ps command again with all the headers, and it's going to show me some hierarchy involved between what is running what, and then pass the entire thing through grep. Now, because it goes through grep, that's going to strip off, for example, the header line, because the header line does not contain my username, Brewstep. This command otherwise, though, returns all the processes on the system, and I am trying to filter out to just mine. And as you can see, this gives me a much more interesting list. I can see the hierarchy of what calls what, and we'll talk about more about that on the next slide, but um, there's a bunch of different headers here at the top. Let's talk about what those are. First of all, the PPID is the parent process ID. And that's the process ID of the process that spawned my particular process. Then the PID column is for the process ID for my particular, um, for, for the particular process that's running. And remember, PPID is who spawned it. This is the actual process ID for the process. E user is the effective user ID, essentially who is the user that's that, that's running it, and if there was any shenanigans involved using switch user uh, to or sudo to change who actually is running the command at any given moment, this will reflect whichever is the actual effective user of it. The stat column here is the execution state for it, and again, more about these symbols here in a minute. Percent CPU is the percentage of CPU time that this process is occupying. Um, so for for large processes, ones that are taking a lot of time, you'll see a significant number for others you won't. For RSS, this is short for real set size, and it's the kilobytes in RAM that are actually in use by this process. Then finally, command is the actual command that I typed in. Okay, so over on this tab, let's look at some of the details here in a little more, a uh, little, little, little more closely. First of all, I've used colors to separate out and to show the parent process ID versus the process ID. So first of all, if you look at this this top one, this is SSD, This is an SSHD uh, instance that's running in root. And this is the the daemon of the SSH um, protocol that allows me to securely SSH into the OSU servers and then run programs on their computers. Here is a particular instance that was given to me, and you can see that the process ID for this one 18778. Uh, and here is its parent process ID, 18776. This is a child of the actual root SSHD daemon. So I was given my own instance of this daemon to run my own commands on. And we'll see that when we write our own shell. We see that typically when processes receive connections, they will spawn off instances of themselves. So here we see that. We see the parent process ID of this, this instance and then my new ID for this. Then Graphically here, we can see that my particular instance spawns a bash, and then that bash has other contents or other processes that it's running. And we see that same relationship here. So finally, this bash is my user interface, 
and it becomes the parent process ID or the parent process for all of the other instances of the processes that I run. Pretty neat. So in the state column here, we've got two different sets of characters. The first one is kind of the general large scale state of that process. And we talked about these in the lecture last time. D will be an uninterruptible sleep, so it usually means there's input and output going on. R is running or runnable. So here we see that our primary, uh, that the actual running process right now, the primary running process is my PS command that I ran. So that makes sense that that's on there since that's what's spitting out this list. S would be for sleeping, which is going to be extremely common. So this is waiting for some sort of event to complete. And then Z would be a zombie, which we briefly mentioned last time. We'll talk a lot more about today. The second character here has a little bit more detail in terms of what's going on. So we can tell if it's high priority, low priority. Uh, in particular, S here means that it is a session leader. So this little lowercase s here. That means that if you happen to kill off this process, it will automatically kill off all of the child processes as well. And that's not something that is guaranteed. That's something that has to be controlled. And in this case, that is going to be standard for this bash. It'll just kill everything off. OK, and then a couple other things. So plus, for example, means it's part of the foreground process group, meaning that it's you know interactively being used as a foreground app in our shell. OK, so here is a different version of PS. This is my PS all a command. This is my alias for a, a more extensive version. This one gives me the processes for all users currently running on the system. It's a much longer list. In particular, I pass this thing through a, a couple of filters here. I use awk to strip off the process IDs that are 0, 1, or 2. And that refers basically to the root processes, which are fairly boring. It's a bunch of kernel threads that aren't uh, very interesting. So I do strip those off. Otherwise, the list is truly gigantic. And it contains a lot of stuff we don't care about. And then I use more at the end so I can spacebar my way through this thing. So this particular list then shows not only my stuff, which is right here. Here you can see the ps command and the awk commands that it's being filtered through, and then the more. But you can also see some commands that other people are running. This is a handy way for me to tell are there processes out of control on the server, etc. And as you can see in the ellipses here, before and after, this is a huge list. This is for every process, or for every process, for every user on the entire system. OK, so a zombie. What is that zombie? Well, when a child process terminates, but its parent doesn't stop and pause to wait for it, then that process becomes a zombie. And another word for that is defunct. This is a screenshot from the Sega Master System game Fantasy Star, one of the first uh, both game systems and first games uh, my family ever got uh, way, way back in the uh, late 80s. Anyway, uh, Fantasy Star was terrific. So zombies, uh, parents don't wait for them, they turn into zombies. So a child process has to report to the parents before the resources get released by the operating system. So even though it's terminated and stopped, all of the resources consumed by that process aren't let go. So the memory isn't let go and a bunch of other stuff. So if the parents don't wait for their children, then those processes become the undead. That's where why they started calling these things zombies. You know, back in the 70s, back in the Gary Gygax, the Dungeons and Dragons um, you know, era, where all of these people were writing these operating systems and programming languages, these things forever consume and are forever enslaved to a a non-life of waiting and watching. Nothing actually happens to these processes. But the actual intention behind it, there's a real reason. The purpose is so that you can keep the state of that process so that later when we run the wait command, as we learned in our previous lecture, that we can actually retrieve that value out of it. These zombies want to be harvested because it gives up the, the last you know, the, the termination signal that killed them or the exit status from when they finally terminate. You get that value back out with wait. So that's why the processes haven't fully cleaned themselves up yet, because if they did, those values would be gone. OK, so let's show a little sample program that allows us to create zombies and then cleans them up at the end. So this is a fairly typical fork. Uh, we see the same switch statement we've seen before in, in previous versions of this code. So in negative one case, if something bad happens, the zero case is for the child, which then immediately just terminates itself. 
And how do we know that? Because it goes switch to case zero, printf terminating, comes down here to this will be executed by both of us, and then we get exit. So it just leaves this process and, and returns immediately, uh, and or just exits and kills itself immediately. The default case is for the parent. So in the parent, it's going to say, I'm going to make a child for 10 seconds. I'm going to make my child a zombie for 10 seconds. Then it tells us um, a particular command that we could use to see that zombie. Then it tells us it's going to sleep. This is an important command, f flush of standard out. What that does is that typically standard input output library functions like printf, when they write data, they're actually storing it in a buffer and they don't actually write it to the screen for some indeterminate amount of time maybe until the buffer finishes maybe until some other system properties fin some other system calls finish up the point is that if you actually want printf to truly send to the screen then you have to flush that buffer so this is how you would do that and uh, you can only flush standard out and standard error you can't flush standard in just as an aside all right so this makes sure that all this text hits the screen and then we go to sleep for 10 seconds then we wait PID on the spawn PID. So we're going to go ahead and fetch all the exit values out of that child and give the child permission to finally terminate and then the parent terminates itself also. And in our output here, a little program is called fork you zombie and what it does is when it runs, here's the parent saying I'm making a child, here's the command you can type to go see that defunct child, here is my parent sleeping, the child then says it's terminated. Then we have a, this will be executed by both of us. That comes from the child. And then here is the parent's 10 second pause, where it just hangs there for, for 10. And then the parent says, this will be executed by both of us. In output, if we fire up a second terminal, in between while this thing is running, or if we had backgrounded this command, and more about backgrounding later, then in that second terminal, if we run a little PS command, we can see the fork you zombie process and we can see its child and we can tell that the uh, this is a child of the parent because here is the parent process ID 17053 here's the child's process ID um, 17053 um, let's see I've got that backwards this is the parent process ID so it, go, it connects this direction the other way then we can see over here the defunct flag says I am the zombie and we can see the Z flag over here says also this one is a zombie uh, and then after the 10 seconds this thing finishes, the child disappears in this bottom entry and, and the, the top one for that matter both disappear. And this is this PS minus elf, uh, pipe it through grep, this is a nice way to get a, a kind of a useful PS just for you. This will return a lot more for you. You can see there's a big list of Brewsteb commands here. Now that's all, it's, it's, this is a better way to do it. I don't get the nice hierarchy, I don't get the nice headers, which is why I created my own version of it, but um, this particular way is is pretty handy. Okay, so how do we deal with those zombies? They stay in the system until they're waited for, and there is an old classic way to deal with them, of course. Now you're really beginning to annoy me. Yeah, good times. Can't go wrong with shotguns, nothing wrong there. Well, let's take a look here at orphan zombies. So an orphan zombie. If a parent process terminates without cleaning up its zombies, then those zombies become orphan zombies. They, they essentially get stuck because the parent disappeared and can no longer wait for them. So what happens? Those orphans get adopted by the init process. And usually that's going to be process ID 1, so the process that kicks the whole rest of the system off, which is where it gets its name from. And this process periodically will wait for all of the orphans that it has inherited. Uh, and in practice, that turns out to be very quickly. So usually less than a second, it'll go through and clean and and clean those out. And the the term for killing off these these zombies is reaping. So R E A P. It reaps the the children. So in this case, the uh, parent of everything kills all of the errant children by reaping the orphans. So the terminology is a little dark, a little grim but that uh, really is the terminology for what we're talking about here. And eventually all those orphan zombies get killed off. All right, so the kill command is a Unix command that we use to kill programs and do other things. And in fact, there's an old version of this called kfork, but really kill is just a misnomer. What it, what it really is doing is it's sending signals. So our next lecture after this is the signals lecture, but we'll talk about them a little bit here. 
So we can use kill, and then we use dash, and then the signal that we're trying to send, and then the process ID of the process that we're going to send the signal to. And the, uh, the process ID affects who it's sent to. So if it's greater than zero, then that means that we're sending it to the signal, uh, or the signal gets sent to the actual process with that process ID. If it's equal to zero, then the signal gets sent to all processes as the, in the same progress group as the sender. So in the shell, that means everything that's in that foreground process group. That'd be the things with the little plus in it, in the PS call that we saw, that we saw earlier. And you can pass in negative values and things get pretty weird, so I'll leave that one up to you to look up. But for the most part, you won't be using any of those but just the one you intend to signal at the time. All right, so more details in the next lecture, but you can use the, there's a signal called kill, which you can put in here. So it's kill minus kill, and that tells the process to just immediately terminate, don't clean up, it's just auto-killed. Okay, so another program that's handy here is called top. And what Top does is it runs an, interac an interactive animated listing of the built-in programs that are running. So it looks something like this. We get a bunch of header values where it'll tell us things like, you know, 703 processes, one running, 697 sleeping, four stopped, and one zombie. It'll tell us the uptime averages. We'll look at that here in the next couple of slides. And then a big list of processes that are running. And this thing updates uh, about every two seconds. And you can change the frequency of that, of that with, with some commands. Uh, top, when you're running it, incidentally, uses a lot of CPU time. So here you can see 3.4% of the CPU is being consumed by my running of top. So do play with this command. It's a neat one. Uh, Control C to get back out of it. All right, so the uptime command is going to show the average number of runnable processes over a few different periods. So when you run this thing, so uptime, it shows us this load average here. This load average is the same load average that we see on the on the top command. So here in top when we see load average and then these three numbers, that's the same type of thing we get from the uptime. This is the average number of runnable or uh, running processes um, or ones that are un uninterruptible over the last 1, 5, and 15 minutes. So having you know 0.2 processes be be runnable over the last 15 minutes means that we were running you know five processes uh, over the course of that 15 minutes. So that's very fast. That means that we are not stalled. It means that the CPU is not the bottleneck. So if the uptime is showing that the runnable queue is larger than the number of cores, then the CPU is the bottleneck and is causing a slowdown. So how many cores are in that CPU? So if I, I think I ran this one on flip or maybe OS class. I'm not quite sure. I don't remember which one I ran this on, but when I ran it, uh, it'll tell me that for um, this this particular file, which stores some information on the processor, the CPU cores was 8, and that it's a Xeon E5-2665. So here is um, you know a little picture of this Xeon package, and you can see this is the neat style where the pins aren't on the actual CPU. They're actually in the socket on the motherboard instead. There's actually a good reason for that. When the pins are on the CPU, it means that it's much more fragile. The CPU is far more expensive than the motherboard. So if the CPU pin gets bent, then you'd have to you know, risk ricking the CPU if you can't bend it back into shape. Uh, whereas if the CPUs, if the pins are bent on the motherboard, then you and you can throw the whole thing away for maybe a, a tenth or half the cost of, the, of a new CPU. So looking at a couple examples here for uptime. This upper one here is showing us that our load averages are tiny, well below one, which means that the CPU is either amazing or it's just not being told to do anything. Our middle one here, this is where we're seeing the CPU is maxed. This is where there's on average one process that's running, which means that it's handling about all it can do at, at any given moment. So there aren't processes stacking up and waiting for it, or else the number would be greater than one. And But there really aren't very many that are running um, with any degree of speed, any degree of uh, multi-process, or not so much multi-processing, but it's not being able to get through multiple processes at once for a given time slice. So here, this tells us it's time to upgrade. Or if the CPU is only ever going to do one thing, then the CPU is exactly properly placed. It's doing exactly its job, and if things don't change, then it's it's perfectly pr provisioned. 
On the other hand, here, this case, this CPU is absolutely the slowdown. Lots of processes are waiting for it, not for I.O., not for memory access, but the CPU is the major problem. And of course, this always happens at 3 in the morning, so you know, be prepared for that. On the other hand, if we have an octo-core CPU, then these particular CPUs, or these particular uptime numbers show us that the CPU is not doing anything at all, because remember there is a eight times factor that's going on here. So here in this next line, we can see that the numbers around eight mean that eight processes are being handled per given time slice. Since it's an octa-core CPU, we would expect to see eight at once, so everything is up by a factor of eight. And on the other hand, if this whole thing you know, is waiting by a factor of, say, five, then there's clearly huge problems. Something enough to stress an octa-core CPU this badly means that there are going to be dire days for you ahead. Okay, job control. So how do we start a program and still retain access to the command line? So imagine we've got another program that we want to run right after. How do we retain control of that? So yeah, another way to ask this is, can we run multiple processes at once? And we call that job control in the Unix world. There can be only one shell foreground process, and it's the one that you're currently interacting with. So if you're at the command prompt, then that means that your foreground problem actually is the shell. So processes in the background can still be executing, but they can also be in you know a bunch of different stopped states. So uninter uninterruptible sleep, uh, interruptible sleep, stopped, or being a zombie. These are all different kind of halting states that they can be in. Uh, so the processes in the background can be in those. When you have a foreground command, you typically won't see it being in any of these states because that would mean that you've lost control of your shell. All right, so in reality, there isn't a difference between processes in these two states. They really are the, the same. The difference is that is the user allowed to enter commands in while the, pro while the previous process is still running? Or do you have to wait for the previous process to run to completion before you get a prompt again? So in a, in a situation where a user enters a command that's intended to run the foreground, so this would be a normal type of command, the process that has been started is going to run to completion before the user is prompted again. That is a foreground process. However, when you enter a command and then immediately get prompted again and the background and the other process hasn't completed yet, that's a background command. It's been placed in the background and you're immediately prompted so you can run the next command. So control input to the terminal is not interrupted by background processes. You can still access your terminal because these background processes don't get in your way for the most part. And we'll take a look at an exception at that here in a minute. Okay, so how do we start up a program in the background in the first place? So ping typically is a program that is going to occupy our foreground. Uh, if we want to run this thing in the background, though, we can put the ampersand there, space ampersand at the end, and that will run this thing in the background. That means we immediately get our prompt back. We can do something else. So here's an interesting point. Just because we have put this in the background doesn't mean that it's not still connected to standard out and standard error. And if it was truly horribly written, your shell was really bad, even standard in could still be pointing at that, although that'd be really unlikely. But this thing is still going to be sending its data to the terminal, meaning it'll still be displayed even if it doesn't have focus, say, even if our text isn't going to it. All right, so if we want to stop a process that is running, so here's my ping command, and you can see that it takes over my foreground process and I can't enter commands anymore. So it starts to ping organstate.edu, which is a DNS redirect for orst.edu. This actually happened when I was an undergrad at OSU. Uh, our original domain name, and in fact what kind of underpins a lot of things, is orst.edu. But one of the problems with that is that they it kept being read as you know www ORST, it looks like worst.education, which is not a good domain name, so they switched to organstate.edu even though it's longer. Anyway, a little bit of history there. So you can see then this is um, going to run a ping command, which is ICMP sequence, and here's a little sequence tracker to show it's, what's going on. The ping value, or the milliseconds, in terms of how long it takes my packets to go back and forth. And uh, 64 bytes is the size of the payload in this thing, although it's largely ignored by the, by the two sides of the ping. Then I hit Control Z, and what Control Z does is it sends the TSTP command, the terminal stop command. 
And what that does is it, it tells us that this process has been stopped and it tells us a number, this is our job number, we'll come back to that, and we once again get access to the shell. So our shell becomes the foreground process again. Here's another extended example. This is, uh, we're going to use the jobs command to see that we're at what we're actually running. So I'm going to ping organstate.edu again. Here you can see the ping starting. I stop it with control Z to send the terminal stop command. It stops the whole thing and it tells me that it's number three. So if I run jobs minus L, what that is going to do is it's going to add the process ID to these uh, to these jobs, which is a handy way, because then I could use the kill command later to terminate them. The dash symbol means that this is the second to last process that I put in the background. The plus means that it's the last process that I put in the background. And here is that organstate.edu ping command that I fired off. And it's number three, as it says up here when I stopped it. Here it is in my jobs list showing me it was the most recent one to be stopped. I can kill it by using the kill command, send the kill signal, which is you know way overkill. That's the die no matter what process isn't even involved. It's just auto killed. And here's the process ID for that. It tells me that job three was killed. And then I can kill, say, um, job one, which is the percent, use this little percent uh, operator. So when I say percent one, I'm saying job one, and that will kill off job one. And this leaves me again with just job two still running there. OK, so foreground and background. So the foreground, I can manipulate that with the FG command for, for foreground. So the jobs numbers that are provided by the jobs command we can use those numbers with the FG command. So I can bring job one from the background to the foreground and start it running again by foregrounding it. So FG% percent one says get job one from the background, bring it up and start it running again if it's not still running. Uh, FG itself brings the most recent backgrounded job to the foreground and starts it running again. So foreground. Conversely, background or similarly background is going to start a specific stopped program that is in the background and keep it in the background but it's going to be running again so background uh, job number one so start it running in the background again keep it running there we can start the most recently stopped program in the background and keep it there in the background with just bg so little commands to manipulate the foreground and background commands all right let's do a, a actual example of this whole thing let me drag over my little uh, terminal window here. This is logged into OS class. So if I'm going to kick off a ping to uh, organstate.edu, and uh, we can see that this is now occupying my my terminal. Uh, I can type commands in here and hit enter, but it doesn't do anything because this ping program doesn't process standard input. Control Z, oh, Control X, that doesn't do anything. Control Z stops it, and now my process is in the background. I can't, or it's it has been stopped and my shell has been returned to the foreground. If I type jobs, it tells me here is the ping command that stopped uh, and been placed in the jobs list as a stopped process. If I run psme, we can see here is my ping command, ping.www.organstate.edu. We can see the t, which is the stopped, um, the stopped state for this process. So that's pretty neat. I can use FG% 1 to re-foreground and re-begin the ping uh, command again. And again, my, uh, my uh, text doesn't do anything here. Control Z this thing again, jobs, I can see it in the background as job 1. Now let's start it up in the background. So this says start up in the background and stay running there. And it returns me this prompt that is this rapidly moving upwards uh, dollar sign prompt indicator here showing that I do have control of my prompt now even though the ping backgrounded command is still writing to the sh to my terminal so I can type PS or here I'll backspace up the S backspace up the W push the S hit return and I can get a PS listing which gets pushed upwards but I can see my ping command and I can see my, my can see my PS command and I can see bash run it again so we can do all kinds of interesting things here, except it's really, really awkward because of all that data being written to the screen. And I can hit Control Z. Here I am, Control Z, and it doesn't do anything because the shell can't be stopped. You can't stop the shell that you're running. I can even use Control C, and that doesn't do anything. That just 
basically reprompts the shell for me. So uh, all of that is awkward. So in order to fix this problem, I'm going to fg space percent one. This is going to foreground the jobs, the job running in the background, so that I can interact with it. So now the ping command has been brought to the foreground, and I can control C to kill it off. So a neat little demo there of who actually is in control. All right, so to suspend a process running in the background when you're at the shell, uh, so for example, if I have this ping command, here, here's uh, www.organstate.edu again, I'm sending all the standard error to slash dev slash null, and all the standard out is going to a log file, and it's been started in the background. So if this thing is running, I can pause it and stop it um, with the kill command. So here's jobs, and it shows me that it's running in the background. And then I can use kill with the terminal stop signal uh, targeted at job one, and that will stop it in the background. And now when I run jobs, I can see that it stopped. So these signals are neat ways to be able to, to interact with processes wherever they are. And it also shows us that the control Z on the keyboard is sending a signal in the same way that the kill command sends a signal. So the keyboard command stroke is no different. It's not special. It's just a built-in signal uh, on the keyboard. All right, so the history command is a way to show all the previous commands that we've run. So in terms of process management, this is a handy way to see what have I done recently. So history five tells me the five last commands. And here, line 1016 is the, uh, the command line 1016 that I ran that was history five. So that's always going to be the one you just did and uh, all the different ones that I ran. I can execute a previous command like this. We can see um, if I run history three, it shows me that there's my history three command, a PS me that I ran, and then jobs. I can run with the exclamation mark line 1030, and it will run jobs again. And no, no output here because there's no currently, there's no jobs that are that are backgrounded or foregrounded. Interestingly, right now, run history three again, and it pushes the list down. Uh, exclamation mark minus two says, give me the one that is two away. So that'd be history jobs. So rerun jobs again. There it is. I would then like to run jobs again. So exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Uh, and that again does nothing. Here I've got a history three command as my last one. And you can see there's jobs in the middle. Not jobs, 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 like it looks like I ran here. Interestingly, this exclamation uh, history expansion method here does not put new entries into the history list. So that's uh, both kind of worrying and interesting, but uh, nonetheless, um, they're all compacted into that one place or not reflected in the history list. And then the history three final command is shown as line 1036. All right, that is our final slide here for the day. I hope this was instructive for you, and we will see you on our next lecture, which is about signals. We'll see you then. Thanks.